morning, everyone, and thank you for being here for the new for our recent, most recent webinar, Low Sales 101. My name again is Albert Luna, and let me give you uh, an agenda. Let's go over the agenda for this presentation. So we'll start with some basic definitions, some definitions that are commonly used in the uh, low sales industry. From there, we'll go on to some of the low sales basics, some of the uh, basic information about how the low sales works. From then, another, some other basic information about strain gauges. And from there, we'll jump on to, we'll be talking about some of the processes that take place here at Interface to enhance the performance of the low sales. One of them is moment compensation. The other is a temp temperature compensation. From there, we'll go on to calibration and talk about some of the parameters or some of the yeah some of the parameters that need to be met by the low cell in order to guarantee its performance. From there, we'll talk a little bit about the applications, about some of the equipment or machinery that uses low cells as uh, as uh, its main component. And we'll wrap it up with a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So let's go over some of the some definitions that are used in the uh, low cell industry. We'll start with axial load, which is a load that is applied directly in line with the line of axis of the low cell. Any any loads that are not applied along this axis are eccentric loads and will introduce errors to our output signal. Calibration. Calibration, again, we'll talk about what uh, some of the parameters that need to be met. It takes place after, basically, is uh, calibration is performed after the complete assembly of the low cell has been carried out. From there, let's talk about capacity, which is how much force, so how much weight, how much load can be applied to the to the low cell. Creep, creep is a change in output, change in electrical output of the low cell when the load and all environmental conditions around it are the same. The flexion, which is the the forming of the low cell under load. Eccentric load, as previously explained, is a load that is not applied along the line of uh, the line of action of the low cell. Hysteresis, nonlinearity, and static static error band are the parameters that need to be met during the calibration process. Output is the electrical signal from the load cell, and rated output is the output that we get out of the low cell at capacity, at the capacity of the low cell or when the the rated load has is being applied to the low cell. And if and we have a more detailed explanation of these definitions on our website and on top of that we have extra definitions or extra extra um, yes extra definitions that on our on our page. Um, along with a more detailed explanation. So let's move on to what a low cell is. So a low cell is a device that will convert a force into an electrical signal. This signal is mm, proportional to the amount of load that is that is being applied to the to the low cell, low cells are designed to measure loads and tension, loads and compression, and also a combination of both. The low cell has no moving parts, and therefore what we have is no wear and tear between the main components of a low cell. What I have here is a slide showing some of the standard models, some of the basic models that we manufacture here at Interface. On the upper left, what we have is a bending beam load cell. Right below it, we have a, a, an SML, which is a dual beam load cell. To the right of that, we have the column style lo uh, load cells. 
The one on the left is a 21 series column cell, which is intended for high capacity applications, usually uh, between 100,000 pounds and above, close to or at 1 million pounds. The one on the right is a WMC style column low cell, and these type of low cells are they work in the range of about 100,000 pounds and lower. This next slide shows uh, other members of the uh, low cell family here at Interface. We have on the, on the left the S-beam type, which are as a smaller, smaller variation of our low cells. These are for applications where spacing is critical. And on the right, we have a load button low cell, which works only in compression. And in this particular example, this load button it has a capacity of about 5,000 pounds. Now let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of a low low profile load cell. In the center we have we have what we call the hub, which in this case has a threaded hole all through it. These come in several configurations. Around the hub we have what we call the gauge cavity, which is made up of uh, bores and beams where the strain gauges are bonded to the flexure. The image here shows the strain gauge, and the strain gauge here is, is made up, uh, or is what makes up the Wheatstone bridge in a low cell. The outer perimeter of the low cell is what we call the mounting ring, connecting wires between each other. We have what we call the uh, interconnecting wires. The upper half of the low cell is made up by the flexure, while the bottom half of the, of the low cell is made up of uh, what we call the base. To protect the gauges and the interconnecting wires from the environments, we install diaphragms to can the, the low cell. In this case, the diaphragms would be installed on this upper portion, on the upper and the bottom portion of the low cell, but for clarity purposes, these have been removed. And also we have the connector, which again comes in different configurations depending on customer specifications. Now let's move on to talking about the main components of the low cell. The first one would be the flexion. The flexure is a load-bearing component of a low cell, and it will deflect under load. It is specifically designed to deflect at a specific locations around the flexure, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. The second main component would be the strain gauge, and the strain gauge measures the strain or the deflections of the flexure. The strain gauge or a series of strain gauge make up or form what's the electrical circuit of low cell using the uh, Wheatstone bridge. And it's again the flexure of the information is what changes the resistance across the strain gauge. Now let's talk a little bit about the flexure design, what's involved with uh, designing one of these flexures. First let's talk about some, about some of the materials that we use, mainly three of them, steel, E4340, we also have aluminum, 2024, and 17.4 stainless steel. 2024 aluminum is typically used for low capacity applications. I want to say 
in the range of, of about 2,000 pounds and lower. E4340 steel is used for higher capacity applications, which go from anywhere between 5,000 pounds and higher, all the way up to a million pounds. And the um, 174 stainless steel is used for hermetic and submersible applications. Thank you, Brian. And also for corrosive environments. Now, two of the critical features, or the yeah, a critical feature of the low cell is the dimensions of the beams. So when we come up with a new flexure design, we look at the uh, thickness, the thickness and the beam and the, and the height of the beams, and that is so that uh, we what we do this in order to target a specific value of uh, shear stress around the, 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 these beams. By carefully designing these beams, what we intend to do is to concentrate the shear stress along the beams, and therefore, because the beams are the parts of the flexure under the highest amount of strain, these the, the beams become the ideal places for in order to bond the gauges, the gauges to the flexure. Now let's let's talk a little bit about the strain gauge itself. What I have here is an image of a shear strain gauge, and let's talk a little bit about the parts that make up the, the strain gauge. What we have here is number one, which is pointing to the grid lines. The grid lines is the pattern in the center of the strain gauge, and these grid lines are what are the parts of the strain gauge that are most sensitive to strain deformations occurring on the flexure. Number two is pointing to the end loops on both ends of the pattern. The end loops are what provide the creep compensation feature of the strain gauge. This creep compensation is determined by the length of the end loops. Number three is the solder pads, and the solder pads provide the locations on a strain gauge where electrical electrical connect, connections can be made across the strain gauge. Number four is a fiducial. We have at least four. In some cases, we have more. In this case, I only have four here, but what the fiducials do is these assist with proper alignment during the gauging process of the uh, flexure. And number five is the backing. The backing has two main purposes. One of them is to isolate foil material from the flexure. And the second is to so and yeah and to isolate and that is to prevent shorts across the across the uh, in be between the foil and the flexure. The second purpose is to provide support for the for the foil material, and it is where the epoxy resin is applied in order to bond the gauge to the flexure. Here we have several gauge configurations, and it all depends on w uh, the type of applicate the uh, strain gauge to be used. It depends on the type of low cell and the application that it's intended for. The first one, the first image on the on the top, is that of a linear strain gauge, and these are the strain gauges that are used to measure strains under bending. These are the type of strain gauges that are used in the manufacturing of MB type low cells or bending beam low cells. The second image is that of a shear stress strain gauge. 
the, this is a type of strain gauge that we typically see or the we typically use for low profile load cells. The third image is that of the Poisson strain gauge, which use which measures strains under norm. Yes, sorry. Uh, it measures strains under nor normal stress. These are the type of gauges that are used in the 2100 series column cells. And the last gauge, the, the last image on the bottom is that of uh, what we refer to as a chevron type strain gauge or dual pattern. These, these strain gauges are used in transducer applications and are used to measure strains under, t under torsion and is what we typically find in a 5400 series reaction torque transducer. Now let's talk a little bit about the Wheatstone bridge. In this schematic representation we have the Wheatstone bridge made up or composed of uh, four, strain four strain gauges. Two are, two are in tension and two are in compression. And this has to be the configuration in order to vary or to change the value of the output signal coming out of a, a strain gauge. Sorry, I take it back. Coming out of a, a load cell. when these strain gauges are under strain, the ones in compression will have a decrease in resistance across the gauge. The ones in tension, their resistance will increase when it's under, under strain. So how does the resistance, how does the resistance across the strain gauge change? For example, if we take a segment of wire and we pull on it or put a tension load across or through this segment of wire, what happens is that its cross-sectional area is decreasing. The result is a decreased current flow across this, this segment of wire. And therefore, what we have is a condition where the electrical resistance across this segment of wire has increased. In the second example, we have uh, the same segment of wire under compression strains. What we have is its cross-sectional cross area is now much larger. So we have an increased current flow across this, this segment of wire and therefore what we have is a condition where we have a decrease electrical resistance across this wire. So now let's let's focus our attention to the gauge area or the location where the gauges are bonded to the to the flexure and see how the flexions in the uh, in a flexure, how the flexures, the flexions in a flexure, are causing the resistance in a strain gauge to vary. So in this case, th this cross-sectional area of a low-profile low cell, what we have in in the indicated by these two blue squares, is the location where the the strain gauge is bonded to the flexure. Right now, in this condition, we have no load being applied to the low cell, so therefore we have no deflection, no deflection across the beams. And again, as, as I mentioned earlier, because of their, the design of these beams, the, these are the weakest sections of a flexure. Now, when we, in this case, when we apply a tension load, to the, to the same low cell, what we have is formation occurring around the gauge area, which is represented by these red lines, these red di diagonal lines. 
a quartz is flexion in this case is not to scale. It's just for exaggerated for demonstration purposes. So now let's move on to explaining how these strain lines are changing the, the resistance across the strain gauge. So if we superimpose the image of a strain gauge across that deformed section and the, and the beams, what we have is the grid lines or the pattern in the strain gauge aligning or parallel to the strain lines occurring across a beam. So what we have in this case is those strain lines are pulling those grid lines in tension and therefore the resistance across this gauge is decreasing. On the other hand, if we look at, at the uh, what's happening on the other beam on that same flexor, what we have again, if we su superimpose the image of a strain gauge across this across the deformed gauge area occurring on the beam, what we have is that the pattern is now is not lined up with the strain lines. In this case, we have the pattern. Perpendicular, perpendicular to the strain lines. So what, what is occurring across this gauge is that, uh, or what is occurring to this strain gauge is that uh, it's under compression and therefore the resistance across this strain gauge is decreasing. So with that in mind, with uh, knowing how the deflections occurring on the flexure are causing resistant changes across the strain gauge. What we have here on the left is a is again the schematic representation of the Wheatstone bridge and but now we have a flow, we have a current flow across this this bridge and the on the and what these arrows are indicating is that uh, when the when the current flow is dividing at this point, most of the flow is flowing to one side of the bridge and flowing across our indicator or our meter from the positive to the negative side and therefore we have a positive signal coming, a positive electrical signal coming out of the load cell. On the other hand, if we have the load cell under compression, what we have is that most of the electrical flow, most of the electric current once it divides at this point is most of it is flowing to this to the, to the left leg of the bridge and they're and they're flowing across a meter from the left side to the to sorry from the negative side of the bridge to the positive side of the bridge and therefore what we have is a negative electrical signal coming out of the load cell and now to talk a little bit about why it is critical for interface to manufacture their own strain gauges, let me pass it on to Brian Peters. All right, thanks Albert. Hopefully you guys can hear me okay. Um, this is something that uh, not everybody is aware of. We, we do make a majority of our own strain gauges. The reason for doing so is to build a better load cell. Uh, when, we, when we make our own uh, alloy for these strain gauges, we can match that to the specific material that we're mounting these to, and doing so, uh, we can get away with using a, a very simple and very reliable Wheatstone bridge circuit that doesn't rely on any modulus compensation resistors. What does that mean? Well, uh, aside from very, very stable temperature performance, it also means that we're not taking any of that signal out of the sensor through the additional resistors. So you end up with uh, more output. A uh, majority of our low profiles are 4 millivolt per volt sensitivity. Uh, so higher output is going to mean better resolution uh, for the test that you're trying to perform. So uh, again, the reason we do it is to build a better product that uh, ends up uh, helping you guys as customers. Thank you, Brian. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the processes that happen along the manufacturing of the low cells in order to enhance the performance of the low cell.
So the first process is called is what we call the moment compensation. And the moment compensation is intended to reduce the forced measurement errors that occur to the output signal due to eccentric loads. And how do we perform it? What we do is we apply, in this case, if you, if you take a look at this schematic, what we apply is a, is a eccentric load to the load cell, and, the, and we rotate this load all the way around the load cell, and at the same time, we are recording the output signal that we obtain from the load cell. Based on those readings, we compensate the cell in order to meet the specific performance parameter for the type of model that we're working with. So in this case, what we have is the uncompensated condition. And as I mentioned, what here is the uh, down on the bottom, we have the degrees of rotation of that eccentric load around the load cell. And on the on the y-axis, what we have is the, the uh, output of the, or the readings that are, we are obtaining from the load cell. And we can see from here that as we rotate that load around the load cell, the output signal is fluctuating. So if we take the highest value and we determine what the difference between that reading and the, the reading that we obtain, that the lowest value of the output signal that we obtain, if we determine what that difference is, it'll tell us, that difference will tell us whether our load cell is, being, is, is meeting our compensation, our moment compensa compensation specifications. In this next slide, let, let me refer back to the previous slide. So here we have about a, a difference of about 12 microvolts per volt. And again, this is in the uncompensated condition. So after the low cell has been moment compensated, we see that that that, that the error or that the, the difference between the uh, higher readings and the lower readings that we obtain out of that low cell is now minimized to just under three microvolts per volt. <clears throat> Sorry. So now let's talk a, li a little bit about temperature compensation. And the reason why we, we per perform this on every single load cell that we manufacture is to reduce four measurements errors that are due to ambient ambient temperature changes. And how do we perform it? We do this again by recording the output signal and we are changing the temperature around the load cell usually in, in the, uh, the typical range would be of about a hundred a hundred degree difference. Typically typically we go from fifteen to hundred and fifteen degrees F. And this and and unlike unlike moment compensation, in the case of temperature compensation, there is no load applied to the low cell. So so what we're doing is basically obtaining the electrical signal, the changes of the electrical signal out of the low cell as they fluctuate with changes with changes in temperature under a no load condition. After the recordings or after the output values have been analyzed, we add we add compensating wire to the bridge in order to minimize these temperature induced errors. So this graph here shows you the difference between the uncompensated low cell and two other conditions which I'll explain uh, right now. For example, in the first curve that we see, the red curve, it represents the output value that we would obtain out of the low cell that has not been compensated. And in this case, we have a, an error of about just under 12 pounds of error that have been introduced into our output signal. 
In the second condition, this blue line it re represents the output signal out of a low cell that has been compensated, but the, comp the compensation has been performed from room to hot temperature, and that and that has decreased the amount of error to our output signal to just under six pounds. However, if we perform this compensation procedure from a low temperature to a high temperature, we see that we see that the values represented by the, by this green curve, the values or the errors that we obtain out of that low cell have been kept to under four pounds. Now let's move on to calibration. Calibration is basically the last step that we perform on a, on a load cell and that is to verify that the load cell meets its performance parameters. Three of them or the most critical ones would be the hysteresis, the nonlinearity, and the static error band, static error band which we refer to as the e SEB. So here is a graph that represents how the nonlinearity and the hysteresis values, how those errors are determined. So what we do is during the calibration procedure, we record the output values of a, of a low cell going from zero all the way up to 100% of capacity and we take measurements at 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100 percent, and then an extra measurement on the way down at 40 percent. So what we have here is what we call the straight, the best fit straight line, which goes from the zero value, the zero reading that we obtain from the low cell, to the output that we obtain from the low cell capacity and the uh, nonlinearity non error would be the difference between the difference in percentage of rated output of the, in this case at 60% of the uh, output signal compared to what would be the uh, ideal value at that same capacity or at that same loading condition. The hysteresis is determined by is determined by determining the difference between the output at forty percent on the on the ups on the ascending and descending readings. And this is how we determine what the how the this is how we analyze the errors introduced or the, uh, what do I want to call it, this is how we determine what, how the um, steric error band is, uh, is determined. So again, looking at the, our curves that are obtained from our calibration procedure, what we do is we draw a line that starts from, from zero Hang on. So, 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 so that it starts from zero. So then, from there, we draw two parallel lines to this to this first line. One, the first one, the one on the bottom, which is our lo our lower limit, it has to go through our value that we obtain at a, a hundred percent of capacity, and then the upper limit line is is drawn tangent to to the uh, to this curve, and these two lines here have to be at the same at the same distance from the from the our first initial line.
So after all it's said and done, what we do is we refer here to our specification chart and we and we make sure that all of those parameters have been met by our load cell. Here we have a segment of our or of our catalog where we show where the static error band, the nonlinearity, and the histories is what the specifications for those values can be found for different capacities or for the different models in this case of the uh, 1200 series. All right, thanks, Nikki. Uh, I'll just touch briefly on a, a few applications uh, that uh, exist in different markets. We're pretty diversified in uh, many different industries. But uh, touching first on oil and gas, uh, you can see a pump jack assembly there. Uh, we have a load cell that actually goes uh, in that uh, on that string that's that's going down into the ground, and uh, that load cell signal is used to basically tell the pump to turn on and off when the uh, when the when the well is ready to be pumped out. Uh, these things don't run all the time, so when the when the oil is ready to be pulled out, the uh, load cell can measure the weight that's on there and uh, get it get it up out of the uh, out of the ground. Hey, Albert. Um, other applications in oil and gas would include uh, line tension monitoring, whether it's a uh, uh, displacement pulley array uh, or something like a hook load cell. Uh, again, those usually rely on deflecting a, a cable that wants to go straight. And uh, from that signal, you can tell how much line tension there is. Uh, we also have some pretty specialized products that can go down hole, uh, in, down, down in that environment, very high temperature, very high pressure. And uh, most load cells do not like either of those. So we have some ways to compensate uh, for those effects. Uh, sounds like some of you guys may be aware of uh, or familiar with material testing. Uh, here's an example of a load frame. Uh, many of our load cells end up on, uh, on these types of frames. And these are used to uh, test very, various material properties, material specimens. And the load cells are essentially the heart of these systems. You need to perform a test. You need to very accurately measure how hard exactly you are pulling or pushing on that part, and uh, the load cell can give that signal back to the uh, the data act system, and potentially also use it for control feedback on the hydraulic side as well, or whatever the uh, the drive mechanism is. Aerospace. Uh, we've got some of you guys joined as well today. Uh, most of you are probably aware that uh, every component whether it's a, a widget or an entire wing or here a fuselage assembly needs to be tested uh, both for static conditions and also for fatigue conditions. Our load cells are used in line on hydraulic actuators. Uh, typically they're multi-bridge sensors so as, as Albert was going over earlier showing you the, uh, the component of a bridge there will actually be a duplicate set inside these sensors and the reason for that is to have a, a separate discrete signal to go back to uh, one, the, the data act system, and then the other can go back strictly to the hydraulic control system, uh, again, as feedback to uh, ensure that you're not pushing or pulling too hard on the component. Um, many other applications, many other industries, but these are just some, some pretty easy ones to, uh, to grasp and uh, some of our more popular ones. So, thank you. I will conclu conclude the... Uh information that we have prepared for you about Low Cell 101 and with that what we'll do is now we'll move on to our Q&A session of this session.